for Crema Media's Polity, I'm Lumkile Ngonfe. Joining me today is author and retired business person, Gary Rafe, here to discuss his book, Stars of the Morning, A History of Michael House. You are most well known as a South African business leader who has served as MD of Diamond Miner, the De Beers Group, but you have written about the history of one of the country's most well-known schools, Michael House in KwaZulu-Natal. Please tell us about your long and storied connection to Michael House dating back to your father Douglas and how that informed your decision to write this book. But funnily enough, it goes a little further back than my father. The very first boy to have his name enrolled at Michael House, this is now going back to 1896, was a, a boy called Charlie Moore, M-O-O-R. And Charlie Moore's grandmother was a Rafe, Annabella Rafe. So uh, we can claim that within our family, the very first boy to be enrolled uh, in a school that started out with 15 day boys in uh, Peter Marisburg, uh, where they had both boarders and day boys, was part of our family. So my father was one of four brothers, and the four brothers were all enrolled at Michael House following after their Moore cousins who had preceded them to Michael House. My dad was there from 1928 until 1932. So it was the logical place for me and my brothers to follow, first of all, our father, and then a whole host of cousins who had also preceded us uh, to Michael House. I arrived at Michael House in uh, 1958 and the previous five years I'd been at Cordwallis Prep School which is on Tarn Hill of Peter Maritzburg and which was founded back in 1913 as a feeder prep school for Michael House. Who was James Cameron Todd and what was his vision for the school? Uh, James Cameron Todd was a child of empire. He was born in Rangoon, Burma and his father was a Scottish merchant who did rather well. He set up a business in Burma, obviously trading in the empire, and this man actually went down in a ship between Rangoon and Calcutta, and he left a widow uh, with six children, of whom James Cameron Todd was the third son, but named James after his father, and she took the family back to Scotland, where they came from. And James Cameron Todd was educated uh, at the Royal School, I think it was, in Glasgow. He also went to university there. Uh, and he emerged as a teacher. He teached for a few years. And then he joined the Church of England. And he was sent out to Freiburg in the then Cape Colony as a deacon. He then goes back to England now, not to Scotland, and he goes up to Cambridge and uh, to a college called Christ's College where he studied theology. Uh, he was then ordained as a full minister of the Church of England in St Paul's Cathedral in London. The church then sends him back to South Africa uh, and this of course South Africa didn't exist yet, this was before Union, they send him back, now not to the Cape Colony, but to the colony of Natal. And they, they send him as chaplain to the Bishop of Natal. And uh, he wanted to set up a school. The church wasn't opposed to him doing it, the bishop wasn't opposed, but they were not give, going to give him the backing of the Church of England in Natal then, uh, for the good reason that there had been an attempt in the 1880s to set up a school very much on the lines of bishops in Cape Town, a diocesan school, and that had failed. And they were therefore rather cheery about lending their support to another attempt because they didn't want to be greeted with a, a, another failure. So James Cameron Todd started the small school in Peter Maritzburg. Uh, it was always his vision that he wanted to take the school into the countryside and that he did in 1901, what we call the migration. So the school was already five years old when it migrated from Peter Marisburg 
to Belgaum. And Belgaum then was the backer beyond. The reason they chose Belgaum is that, first of all, most importantly, it was a railway station on Natal government railways so that there was access to the school. You could get there by train from Peter Maritzburg or going from the, from the north side, Escort, where I come from, Ladysmith. Uh, and the other thing is it had ample groundwater, lots of water. So that was James Cameron Todd's vision to take it to the country. What he also did in the same year, what had been his private enterprise, the school, he then became a diocesan college. Then the church did lend its support to it. The Bishop of Natal became the chairman, and it still remains the diocesan college. James Cameron Todd stayed on for a further three years, and then in 1903, after an argument on financial matters, he handed in his resignation and he returned to England where he was involved in two further schools which he founded. They were both prep schools. In the second one that he founded, he fell in love with an Irish teacher, a young girl. He was 40, she was 20, and she was a Roman Catholic. He was an Anglican minister, canon by now. And uh, the guardian of his wife-to-be thought that this was an impossible match. And so the girl was sent off to Canada, uh, and they were not to see each other or write to each other for two years. But I'm pleased to say that James Cameron Todd was ardent. He had red blood in his veins, and after two years he could bear it no longer. He went to Canada and married uh, the love of his life, and they bred two daughters, who in turn had children. So uh, that was the life of James Cameron Todd. Sadly, he died. He, he always had some health problems, and he died in 1925. What sort of challenges did Todd encounter in establishing an independent diocesan college in Natal with the Board of Governors? And in what ways does the Anglican faith continue to underscore the school's cherished ideals? Some of the challenges I guess I've, I've alluded to, it was quite something. During the siege of Ladysmith in the Boer War, there were three men who were going to be very prominent in Michael House's history who were all locked up, they're all part of the British Army, locked up in the siege of Ladysmith. And uh, they had all promised money to his new foundation. And there's an interesting story how they had to be reminded of their undertakings to the new school by heliograph. The way that they communicated with the British locked up in Ladysmith was by he heliograph from a great big hill near Weenan where the British heliograph was so that it was able to make messages back and so it reminded these three gentlemen, uh, and most important of whom was a man called Frederick Tatham, uh, that uh, they had promised money to this new foundation. Uh, Todd's problems uh, were nothing to do with the boys. The boys absolutely revered him. One of his problems would have been finding staff but he managed to get one or two interesting people. Uh, one of the young men that was sent to him from England, recommended to him, actually then worked for the school for the next 30 years, a man called Charles Hanna. Uh, the problems that Todd had were essentially financial. For the school to succeed, it had to be solvent. And that is the question that remained a great problem in the school for the next 70 years it remained a great problem for the school of keeping solvent. But in the time of Todd, it actually, because the governors, of whom I've told you the Bishop of Hotel was now chairman, Frederick Tatham, who I mentioned, was uh, the big lay presence of the board, uh, they fell out with Todd on his financial stewardship of the school, and they then put down an edict that the only money that he could spend on uh, anything other than food, effectively, was on breakages. And then they heard that Todd had ordered a piano. And when they objected to that and said that would have to come out of his own pocket or out of the pocket of the school, it wasn't going to come from the governor's funds, he handed in his resignation. So I have a sympathy with Todd 
in as much as the school had been his undertaking, as I said, private undertaking from 1896 to 1900, private undertaking. He had drawn no salary during that time either. And now suddenly he was supplanted at his own volition. He wanted to make it into a trust. So there is now a constitution and a board of governors and the bishop now took his place on chairing the board. And so uh, uh, that's why Todd finally decided to pull out. The Anglican church remains deeply embedded in the school. The chapel by many people is still regarded as the center of the school. Not only is there a chaplain, and often a chaplain and an assistant chaplain, but also a great number of the, the principal, whom we call the rector, and a lot of his staff members are often lay ministers as well. Every year, the boys who are in B block, B block is the year before matric for us, go to a camp on the Tugela River called Emseni, Place of Blessings. And they have a camp there doing catechism, preparing for confirmation. And what is remarkable, even in this day where people are not as religious as they used to be, Michael House bucks the trend. The vast majority of the boys in B Block do volunteer to go. And of those that go, virtually all then volunteer to be confirmed by the Bishop of Natal. So it's just a very good measure of how much Michael House remains true to its Anglican roots and true to its Anglican faith. How did Michael House respond and adapt to tumultuous historical periods in South Africa, particularly during the Anglo-Boer War and World Wars I and II? So, in the Boer War, it was small in Pisa Marisburg. <laughs> there were these important people locked up in Ladysmith. Then they came out. So let me go on to World War I and II. There's a book written by two eminent uh, Englishmen called the public schools. As you know, public schools in the English terminology means independent schools. The public schools in the Great War, being World War I, a generation lost. And that's because the people who became young subalterns were often drawn from the boys coming out of public schools. And those are the poor boys who had to stand up in the trenches and say to them, up boys and at them and run into the murderous machine gun fire coming from the German side. And so there were very many more proportionately killed of them. In this book that I'm citing, Michael House stands out as the only school in the whole of the British Empire that lost its headmaster, whom we call a rector. He died, he, he had a tremendous crisis of conscience, did Rector Brown, between his commitment to Michael House on the one side and on the other hand of fighting for, for king and country. And he finally was given leave of absence by the Board of Governors to go home, as he called it, to France to fight. He was given a commission and he was overseeing some repair works at a trench at a place called Guillemont on the Somme and he was killed by a sniper's bullet. Uh, he's buried in the Delville Wood Cemetery in France and at the centenary of the uh, Battle of the Somme, so 2016, about 40 of us gathered together from Michael House to make a pilgrimage to the Somme to visit his grave site, to hold a service there, and also to go to the great Tiepval Arch. The Tiepval Arch commemorates uh, the 50,000 English soldiers who have no known resting place and included in those are five boys from Michael House who have no known resting place. They died at uh, the great battle of Delville Wood uh, where the shelling was so intense that it simply and went on and on for four or five days it simply blew men to pieces that there was nothing left to bury afterwards. In the haunting words of Rudyard Kipling their resting place known only to God. To what extent do British public schools serve as an exemplar to the school life experience at my class? Some years ago, I went with the then rector uh, of Michael House, Guy Pearson, 
There was a night class old boy who was in charge of the uh, English department at Eton. And Eton is regarded as probably of those elite schools, the most elite in England. Uh, we visited the headmaster of Eton and then we went through to see the man they call the provost, who's effectively the chairman of the board of governors, uh, a man called Sir Eric Anderson. And uh, when we came in, Sir Eric Anderson said rather grandly to us, is it curiosity which brings you to Eton? I avoided the question. I said, some years ago, when an ex-headmaster of Eton visited Michael House, he endeared himself to his audience by saying, I'm the ex-headmaster of the Michael House of Berkshire. <laughs> so I then said to, to Sir Eric Anderson, I said, of course, in our infancy, we were regarded as another British public school of the empire. And uh, we measure ourselves by famous institutions like yours here, like Eton College, like Winchester, uh, etc. And so uh, that is what the connection is. We, we like to measure ourselves by you. I hope that that still goes on because I think it's still a good measuring rod. There are only two all boys, all boarding schools left in South Africa, and they happen to be Michael House and Hilton College, cheek by jowl, in the KZN Midlands. There are none left in Australasia, and there are only three or four left in England, Eton, uh, Radley, Harrow, and I think Winchester. And uh, I think the reason why there are so few now even left in England is because financial need what was the school's reaction to the entrenchment of apartheid? Can you highlight the challenges and repercussions that Rex Pennington and successive rectors and governors faced when it was decided that the school would admit black pupils? It would be nice to pretend that uh, Michael House was on the side of the angels at this time. The voting statistics tell us that actually uh, white English-speaking South Africa also became fellow travellers of apartheid and voted for uh, the apartheid government. Under Rex Pennington, you're quite right, the first coloured boy to be admitted was a man called Kelvin Bosch. And even then, uh, one can't say the Board of Governors are all so liberal that they did this easily. Uh, Rex told me himself that they debated the issue for the whole day uh, and they finally agreed that this boy, Calvin Bosch, who I met for the first time at uh, Exclusive Books, he came to the launch there and he introduced himself. When Calvin Bosch, uh, at the, right at the end of the day, one, one of the very conservatives got, suddenly piped up and said, where's the boy going to sleep? <laughs> Can you believe that? Um, in the 1980s, Shell started a scheme in order to recruit black boys of merit into Shell and to put them right through university as well. They sensibly thought of having a bridge between the schools at which they were at and university, and they selected in KZN, and perhaps elsewhere as well, but in KZN they selected the three private schools, which had sixth form. So sixth form is post-matric, it's the same thing uh, in South Africa. And certainly in the case of Michael House, there were, I think for three years running, there were two or three black boys who came to Michael House specifically in post-matric. The first boy to come to Michael House is what we call a CAC, a new boy, a newbie at the age of 13, therefore, was a man called Injabulim Mtembu. And Injabulim Mtembu came to Michael House, uh, I think it was 1982-83. And uh, he has written a deeply disturbing, uh, excoriating piece, which I asked him for, and which is in this book, on his time at Michael House. Uh, he arrived there and he said 
The first thing was one of curiosity, the reactions of the other boys, curiosity. Uh, where had he learned to speak English so well, which meant that he didn't speak with a Zulu accent, this is a boy from Shawe. And secondly, what did his parents do? In other words, how come his father uh, could afford to send him to Michael House? Things got worse, he said. Somebody spread the rumour around the school that he was being funded at Michael House by the ANC. And then he met a great deal of hostility. Uh, pejoratives. And he said it was like a, a survival course, you know, which parts of the school that he could feel safe in and which houses, he said, where there were, where there were naked racists who would taunt him. We, we have a great institution at Michael House called Free Barns, where on Sundays you go out of the school, you roam the countryside. And there was a white boy that he became very friendly with from the same house. And they were together and he said, one of the most awful moments in his life, they were out on free bounce together and this other boy burst into tears and said, the other boys in the house say that I'm not allowed to see you any longer. And so the one and only friend that he had, so he could no longer see. And Jabulu was good enough to say that things got a bit better after two years because suddenly there were rather more black boys that arrived and suddenly he felt uh, the protection of them around him. Uh, and now, uh, he is the governor of the school, he is in Jabulu, and also uh, speaks very positively about what he calls the real transformation of the school. What are the notable changes that were made to school life at Michael House following South Africa's democratic dispensation? As a former chairman of the school's board of governors, how did you go about advancing racial transformation across key structures of the school? Well, I wasn't I wish I could take credit for it, but I can't. I wasn't then chairman. <laughs> I became chairman of my old school in 2008. Uh, so that was uh, some 14 years afterwards. It wasn't by a big bang, 1994. It had been happening so since in Jabulo's time. If he got there in 1982, it meant that it was some uh, 12 years before the new South Africa. And during that time, the government had been turning more and more of a blind eye to what happened in the private schools as far as, you know, uh, breakdown of racial barriers was concerned. Of course, in the state schools, we know that right until 1994, uh, the white schools stayed the white schools. Uh, so Parktown Boys High, which is right next door to here, remained an all-white school. At Michael House, that had been breaking down. Funny enough, the first boys you couldn't regard totally as white were Chinese boys. There were two or three Chinese boys at Michael House when I was there. And let's go further back and say the discrimination went all the way back up till the late 1930s. There'd been no Jewish people at Michael House. Only in 19, late 1930s, and uh, after a considerable amount of thought about it, were the first Jewish boys admitted to Michael House. So it has a long history, this uh, exclusionary way of behaviour. By 1994, if I remember right, probably up to 20% of the boys were non-white. Many of those were actually Indian boys, and a lot of them when the Model C schools were desegregated, uh, a number of them left Michael House to go to schools like Marisburg College, Durban High School, etc. Uh, but if we use the statutory meaning of black, being non-white boys, uh, we were already uh, at that sort of level perhaps approaching 20% uh, coming to 1994. I will allude to one incident which I was very much involved in. I became chairman just after we had had a uh, strategic review. And this strategic review in which I had taken a part the year before I became chairman, 2007, had addressed the question of racial makeup of the school. And uh, I was one of those who had uh, 
argued that we should have targets. And the targets we decided on, this is now just in the strategic meeting, was that by 2015, I think it was a third of the governors should be black, a third of the teaching staff should be black, and much the same of boys. I suddenly was in the chair and uh, there was some pushback. And then the Bishop of Natal, himself uh, a very eminent person, not white himself either, uh, in fact Indian, Bishop Reuben Philip, uh, he contacted me and he said, I think you're making a mistake. If you exceed your targets, people say, why did you set them so low? And if you don't get the, up to those targets, then you've made a rod for your own backs. So he argued against it. And finally, I had a great big meeting of all the governors and the bishop and everybody else. And in that meeting, I first of all asked the bishop to explain what he had said to me, which he did. I then asked to Prince Zuzi Butelezi, who sat on the board to give the opposite point of view, the desirability of targets. The majority of the board went the way of saying, let's not have targets per se. And so I wrote up something that rather said is that we had aimed more progressively that the makeup of the school, governors, academic staff and boys, reflected more the makeup of South African society as a whole. And that's where it remains. Since then, I think we actually did very well as far as black governors were concerned. I think in my time, there might have been up to four or five, well, there's certainly five lady black governors. And quite apart from Butelezi and others, there were another three or four black governors. There's been a great amount of progressive work to try and make sure that the culture of Michael House is not antipathetic to any race group and that is something that we are continually going for. What sort of responses do you hope the book engenders from the public, especially from those who do not have an affiliation with the school? Michael House doesn't exist in a vacuum, it exists in an environment. So I've tried to relate the Michael House history to the environment where it's found itself, the South African environment. And so it's split into four parts. The first part is called British Imperium, so here is a creature of the empire, the British public school, founding itself uh, in Natal. So that's British Imperium, 1896 to 1931, the Statute of Westminster, under which the British Parliament finally accorded full legislative independence to South Africa. The next 30 years, 1931 to 1961, Republic, I call the last outpost, which was the sobriquet that Natal had, was the last outpost of the British Empire. 61 to 94 I call apartheid and the struggle, the counterpoint, one against the other, and then 94 onwards, the new South Africa. And as a theme going through the book, not in any particular order, but whenever it becomes relevant, it seems to me, to comment on the environment in which my class finds itself, I will then talk about it here. Is it, you know, for instance, you talk about apartheid, very important here is to record that in 1947, I think I put, the unthinkable happened. Uh, the United Party lost power in the national elections to the Nationalist Party. I'm not pretending the United Party was a, a very liberal organization, but that is when you got systematic uh, and legislated apartheid being enacted in South Africa from the arrival of the nationalist government to power in 1947, which lasted all the way through to 1994, of course. Uh, so I think that's got a great relevance uh, to, uh, to schools uh, like, uh, like Michael House. That was Gary Rafe discussing his book, Stars of the Morning, A History of Michael House.